So here we go again. We continue our look at the Weimar Republic. And this is part one. So here we're looking at um, the second phase of Weimar life, right? So in the previous, we looked at the establishment of the Weimar Republic and some of the um, an organizational structure. Then we looked at the first, um, maybe like maybe like the baby years, 1919 to 1923, and um, the challenges that the state faced during those times and kind of the responses. So now we're gonna get into basically like the really nice years, I guess, from 1924 to 1929. And so this is when we have um, Stressemann as the head and, uh, and Hindenburg. And so we're going to look at this economic recovery that occurred and uh, kind of like, was it really a recovery? Which brings us to our learning outcomes. Yep, yep. Uh, so obviously at the end of this, um, basically con comparing and contrasting what we've learned from the beginning to see uh, what the real changes were, the political and economic changes that happened at this time. And then really in looking at those changes, how effective were the policies that were implemented and how effective were those changes in kind of creating a robust state? Spoiler alert, um, maybe not very since the state didn't last so long. Yeah. Okay. So before we head into the discussion, uh, you need to do a bit of review. So we've looked at all of this stuff before, go back to peacemaking um, and peacekeeping and look at the international context, right? Because all of this stuff that's happening within Germany at this time is going to be influenced with what's happening internationally. And that um, helps you have a more holistic understanding of what's going on. And of course, this review is really good to bring it to the forefront, kind of start helping you get ready for the um, uh, uh, end of year exams or the world exams. And then, um, yep, so it's a really a two-way street. So um, the influences, uh, the context of the influences and basically how they then impact each other, right? So what, what's happening internationally is going to impact Germany and what's happening in Germany is going to then impact the rest of the world. So I know you don't want to, but really stop the video right now. Um, I know you've kept your stuff in order. I know I'm dreaming, right? Um, and go back and take a quick look through and uh, take some notes, kind of, you know, summarize it all. Now, I sincerely hope that you did what I asked you to do. Um, I always live in hope. And so uh, let's look at this political stability that came about as a result of the changes brought about the, by these two dudes. So we're looking at Stresemann and Hindenburg. Now Hindenburg still has an awesome, awesome, awesome Junker stash, um, but uh, Stresemann a bit of a disappointment in the stash department, I know but it's really the combination of these two dudes together that kind of bring about uh, the changes that we're going to be talking about. So here we go. Um, so we had these crises, crisis years of 1920, 1923, and that's pretty much um, what we had basically been talking about in terms of the Ruhr crisis and then the following economic crisis. And then in, um, 1923, we have this grand coalition uh, that is formed with these elections. And so uh, this was kind of a turning point for, the, for Weimar because for the first time you had a republic, the republic had leaders that were not formed um, associated with the Treaty of Versailles. These are people that are respected. So kind of like all of the negativity attached to the Treaty of Versailles falls away and there's um, this opportunity to move ahead, right? But uh, basically by 1923, um, at these elections, the, um, the government of Kuno, the dude who was there previously, had, uh, had failed. And so hence the, these, you know, all of the stuff that's going on, yeah? So 
um, Stresemann is appointed chancellor and he leaves the chancellorship after three months uh, and becomes the foreign minister. And there he was really instrumental because he helped this reconciliation of Germany within um, with the rest of the international community. So you should go back and look at the notes in the chapter on the rehabilitation of Germany. And so the thing about Stresemann though is he did not really believe in, in democracy. He wasn't a Republican. He wasn't ideologically on the left. He just basically thought that this was the best thing that they had at the time. All of the other alternatives that people were putting forth uh, were not going to work out. And so he is politically, um, he's considered politically to be a traditional conservative. And so this was also one of the things that helped him get a lot of respect because he's coming from, uh, uh, um, because aside from all of the other um, uh, social Democrats, he's able to get like support from the people who are on the ideological right. And then in 1925, Hindenburg becomes president with the death of Ebert. And this is also another turning point because he is a hero of the war. He was one of the generals. Um, he was, a, um, I'm sorry, he was a former field uh, marshal uh, in the war. And so he has unimpeachable um, patrioticness. And so uh, nobody could argue with him. And because he was a former general, he now brought the military to be in full support of the government, which um, Social Democrat Ebert was not uh, able to do. So it was like a chancy and kind of unstable alliance between Ebert and the military, but now the military is firmly behind the government. And of course, Ebert, um, I'm sorry, Hindenburg is von Hindenburg, which means that he was um, of the aristocr arist aristocracy. And so he brings in that group of people as well. Again, people on the right who were challenging the democratic government. And he also kind of has this nostalgia. It's really because of his like awesome stash, but he has this uh, nostalgia attached to him as an aristocrat and the awesome stash that brings in the ideas of the better days of the empire. So in a way, um, you have Stresemann, who is uh, traditionally conservative, and then you have Hindenburg, who is um, also conservative, and kind of these two guys together presage or kind of give people this, this feeling of stability. And because of that, uh, they're kind of able to move forward. All right. So again, we're still talking about the overall political issues or the political stability um, of this time. So one of the things that does happen is that you do have this um, economic recovery. And so the economic recovery also helps to quiet political um, opposition. So it's kind of like a bit of a symbiosis that these two things are working together. Um, and uh, so, and this political opposition is quiet because of the respect, as we said, about the two most visible leaders of this time. The other thing that's happening is um, once Stressman organizes, or well, once the Dawes plan comes into effect um, as a result of, um, of like uh, Locarno and all of this stuff, the industrialists are going to benefit from the renewed investment that comes into Germany. And, um, and these industrialists were a very vocal op um, part of the opposition from the right. So this is going to help as well, right? They appoint a general um, as defense minister. This of course is going to help quiet the army. Again, putting a lid on opposition that's coming from the right. The 1928 election, so by the time we get to a few years in, the 28 elections were very favorable to those to the center because um, political extreme, extremist groups like the Nazis, like um, the Communist Party, these re received a l less than 30% of the votes in total. So all of them, all of the ex most extreme groups were um, 
really uh, not represented in the government. And so we have a more moderate right stack and more stable coalitions and essentially a government that is better able to work cooperatively. So the result of um, sort of this coming in at this political stability and this quieting on the right and um, the international and domestic policies of, uh, of this new government is going to be economic stability. And so one of the things that I spoke about previously was this replacement of the rights mark um, with the Renton mark. And so that is the rights mark would have been that incredibly um, devalued currency. And so now we have the Renton mark. And so Germany didn't have the gold reserves to back it up but it was backed, as I said previously, by the agricultural and industrial resources. This is a polite fiction that the rest of the world was just like accepted because it, was, it allowed for some stability. And so remember that Germany herself was kind of like this lodestone economically within Europe. She had been a major trading partner of, uh, of the major economies in Europe and then also with the US um, prior to World War I. So this was kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was a very big need for the economic situation to return to some level of normalcy. So people willing to accept it for that stabilization factor, despite the lack of gold um, to support it. And so as we know, there was renewed investment in the economy with the Dawes plan. And um, this is going to help in terms of more jobs, reducing that unemployment, reducing um, the reasons why people are going to be attracted to the, uh, to, um, the extremist groups. And then there was a growth in industrialization, a stabilization in, in industrialization. And so at this point, the overall growth um, matched that of uh, 1913. So they see sort of a reestablishment of, um, of, of the stability that Germany was enjoying before World War I. So in terms of the Dawes plan, uh, not gonna go very much in depth into it because we, we discussed it at greater depth last year. So please make sure you go back to and review your notes about the Dawes plan. Um, if I were you, I would pause. Now, I know you didn't pause. Y'all never pause when I tell you to pause, um, but uh, basically, what we have now is the international situation changed in Germany's favor. All of these uh, various um, uh, things that were happening in terms of the, uh, the Ruhr crisis, the change in international perception, uh, the League of Nations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, basically, the Germany is no longer going to default on her loans. They have been restructured. Um, I mean, default on the reparations payments that are required as a result of, uh, of the Treaty of Versailles. So they have been restructured and reduced, and Germany will pay, in, um, and then so she will then get um, uh, US loans. And um, the French also promised not to force payments and to get out of the Ruhr. So essentially, Germany is going to benefit from this in a number of different ways in that um, she gets more sovereignty. So one of the things that people were really upset about was this occupation of various various places within Germany. So now, of course, France and Belgium are forced out. And then additionally, this means that um, the League of Nations and the um, foreign occupation of the Rhineland is um, the timetable is stepped up so that they're going to leave more quickly. And then, of course, um, uh, they get this economic stability. Now, the international community was interested in doing this, one, be for financial reasons that uh, they're gaining from having a, um, a industrialized functioning Germany and potential consumer of, uh, of uh, manufactured goods. But people are super afraid of, of communism. 
And the political instability in Germany was just too frightening. And so they wanted to prevent a political disintegration, disintegration of Germany. They were, um, there was fear of like the left, that is especially the communists, gaining greater power. And, um, and then, of course, uh, sympathy after the Ruhr crisis. 